Man. It is crazy to see what God has done come on through you, through you. No matter how long you've been a part of our journey, if you were here sitting in that portable location at Nationwide Hotel and Conference Center, setting up, tearing down every week, whether you've just come since COVID, you are a part of what God is doing here. The Upside Down Kingdom, this story is all about us partnering with God in promoting in advancing his kingdom, his mission in this world. So I want to say thanks to those of you who have been in with us. You're in, right? We talk about it at every welcome party, everything we do. You can see it on the wall in the lobby. You want to be in at AC, you got to be involved. You got to get in a group and on a team, right? You got to be uh, inviting others. It's a core value. We believe that you have a story that God wants to use, and we've tried to do our very best week in and week out to create an environment that you can invite people to, where they can come to meet Jesus, the one who can change them and, and give them a new life. And that's been our mission, helping people discover new life in Christ. And then, and then you got to be invested. Those are the three ends to get in, involved, inviting, and invested. And today, as we continue on in this upside down kingdom, we're going to be talking about the role your investment plays in the kingdom of God and what Jesus has required from those of us who have decided to follow him and are committed to not just building our kingdom on this earth, but establishing his. Amen. So today we're going to dive into that. And again, we're in this series, Upside Down Kingdom. It's all about the Sermon on the Mount. We're going to be in this over the next uh, about eight to ten weeks here. Uh, and we're in a season that we're calling Awakening. And we're reading the Word together. How many of you are enjoying the New Testament 90-day reading plan? It's just so cool to see the interaction. If you uh, didn't get in, you can still do that. Text uh, AC90 to 94000, and you'll just have to catch up, all right? You're a little bit behind, but you can do that. Catch up, be a part of what God is doing. It's so cool to see as we are reading his word, and, and as you go through the gospels right now, we're in Mark, that, that Matthew Mark, and we're seeing all these principles of Jesus' kingdom as he taught and, and talked about it through his ministry and establishing that. And so Jesus, in this sermon, literally takes the world's idea of what it means to, to have life and life to the full, and he flips it upside down. And it's the upside down kingdom. And he wasn't just giving a persuasive speech and trying to kind of sway people to follow him. This was him establishing the framework and the foundation of what it would mean for those who have decided to follow Jesus. And he goes through this Sermon on the Mount. He says, you have heard it said, but I say... This is the way it was, but this is how it's going to be. And he literally takes their world, their idea of following God, and he flips it upside down. And so today we're going to talk about money. Yeah, it's always like two people are excited. <laughs> Jess was, came in my office praying before service, getting ready, and she says, how are you feeling about today? I go, babe, I'm talking about money today. You know how that how that goes. And she goes, oh yeah, you're right. No, she was, she was like, it's going to be good. It's going to be good. First service was good. You're going to make it through it. But you go, well, God, come on, it's the birthday. Come on, let's just celebrate what God has done. Well, one, do you know how much money it's taken for God to do what he's done? Do you know how much more it's going to take for God to do what he's going to do? And you go, well, why, why can we just, you know, talk about something else in the upside down kingdom today, like prayer? And, but here's the, here's the reality. Jesus talked more about money than anything else. He knew that there would be this internal struggle that you would have with the issue of money. And it starts really when we're very young. The other day, Maddox and I were shopping in the store. And we're going through. And he'll randomly just be like, hey, Dad, yo, that's a cool toy. I need that. Can I get that toy? And so there's times where I'll challenge him. I'll go, yeah, sure, son, you could get it. I think it's, let's see there, $12.99. $12.99, yeah. How much money you got in your piggy bank? he will be like, oh, well, I got, uh, you know, I think, do you have enough to cover it? Well, yeah, I have enough to cover it. All right, well, then you could get it if you want. If you really want it, you could get it. He says, well, I don't want to spend my money. I want you to buy it with your money. <laughs> and I go, well, that's not how this is going to work. You don't need that. I provide what you need and then some, right? 
but you're going to have to spend your money if you want that. And it's really not even his money, right? It was given to him probably by me or his grandparents. And so it's like, but still, he's like, well, no, nah, I mean, I don't want that. Then let's just go. I'm like, you sure you don't want it? Well, yeah, I, I want it, but I don't want to spend my money on it. I want you to buy it for me. And that happens all the time. And even from a young age, we see that money has a strong grip on us, doesn't it? And for many of us, we have a strong grip on it. And it's hard to let go of it. And Jesus knew this tension would be there. That's why he talked about it. Two-thirds of all his parables, the stories that Jesus made up to illustrate and prove his kingdom principles dealt with money and possessions. In the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, that give us Jesus' ministry, that that show us what Jesus did, what he taught. One out of every 10 verses deals directly with money. 2,300 verses in the Bible deal with money. It's five times as much as prayer and faith. Jesus knew when it came to his kingdom that you and I would have a temptation to build our kingdom while neglecting his He knew that we would be tempted to invest in the temporal and neglect the eternal. And so throughout the Gospels and then those who wrote the New Testament, the Apostle Paul, these principles are driven throughout the Scripture about money and what we're to do with it. And most of us know what Jesus said. It is more blessed to give than it is to... You guys are biblical scholars. If you break down that word blessed, it literally means happier is the one whose life is ordered around giving and not receiving. It is more blessed to give than to, one more time. It's easy to say it, easy to preach it, a lot harder to live it. It's a challenge, it's a tension, it's a wrestling because I believe happier is the one who gets the boat, baby. (laughs) Happier is the one who gets to go on all those vacations. That's what makes me happy. And in this kingdom, this world we live in, that's what they teach. It is counter-cultural. Jesus flipped it upside down. He said, no, you've been taught, you have heard it said, you have thought, the world says, everything you see, every advertisement, all of it says, happier is the one who consumes, who gets, who acquires, who builds, who has. But we all know people who have a lot and are not happy. And they're not experiencing the blessings that comes with being a follower of Jesus. And so at Adventure Church, we have strived to create that culture of radical generosity. It is written on our wall. You cannot outgive God. So God's followers will be invested in his kingdom. It's not a maybe, not if you want to. If you are a follower of Jesus, you will be invested in his kingdom more than your own. So we have this value of investment. We believe you can't outgive God. Because he gave his son for you. For God so loved the world that he gave. Biblical scholars, I'm telling you, you guys are on it today. Gave, he gave Jesus. God so loved you that he gave Jesus for you. Died in your place, in my place. You could never outgive that. Are we all in agreement? And then he says, when you give to me, you can't outgive me. See that I won't open up the windows of heaven and pour out a blessing upon you that when you're about my business, I'll take care of your business. The principles of the upside down kingdom. And so today there's two demands that Jesus requires from those who are his followers when it comes to generosity. And the first one is this, is you have to choose generosity over greed. It's a choice. Some people have the gift of giving. Maybe you're here today. I don't know a lot of them, but some people literally, the Bible says that there's a spiritual gift of giving. People who just like to give. 
They love to give gifts, right? It's like someone at work, you like walk in and like there's something on your desk and they're like, just thinking of you and, it's, and you're like, oh my gosh, this is so meaningful. Like, how did they know? They're so thoughtful, they're carried, right? Those are few and far between though, right? Most of us are like Maddox. <laughs> I want my money and I don't want to spend it on you. <laughs> I want you to spend your money on me. You be the gift giver, right? God will bless you for it. I'll be on the receiving end, right? That's what's more natural to us. Some of you have that gift, and we have those people in our church who give extravagantly to the kingdom of God. It will blow your mind what some people invest into the kingdom of God, into the things of God. But generosity will always be a choice. Listen to what Andy Stanley, uh, one of my favorite pastors, communicators, leaders, he defined generosity this way. He says it's the premeditated, calculated, designated, emancipation of personal financial assets. Premeditated, you have decided ahead of time you're gonna be generous. You have pre-decided, you calculate it, you pick a percentage, we're gonna talk about this. You pick a percentage and you give it first. It's designated, it goes first before anything else and you emancipate, it's freeing, it's freeing your resources to the kingdom of God, to generosity. And most Americans, again, don't understand a life built around generosity because it is so counter-cultural. We've been taught to look out for numero uno. Me, myself, and I, and those that I love, come first. That's the priority, right? And most people, when asked, this, uh, surveys tell us that most people, when asked, would say they're generous. Hey, are you a generous person? Absolutely. Absolutely. Just last week, my buddy posted a GoFundMe. I gave 20 bucks. I gave 20 bucks. And people think, well, that was, that was generous. And sure, it is generous. But listen, generosity is more than random acts of giving. It's not random. It doesn't just happen every now and then. Generous people never have to be sold, inspired, or, or convinced to be generous. Generous people have a plan. And again, it's counter-cultural. But as Christ followers, we believe that his way is better, right? We believe it. We believe following God is the path of fulfillment. Jesus talks about this throughout the Gospels. He, he illustrates it with different parables all around money. And I hope you're reading the New Testament with us because you're going to see all of it. You're not just gonna go, well, Kyle says that Jesus talks about it, but no, you're gonna actually see the principles that Jesus teaches and how greed it comes so natural to us. In this world, it's all it promotes. But people who build their lives around generosity, according to Jesus and according to studies, are way more fulfilled, they're way more content, and they're better with their money. Greed, defined in scripture, is the assumption, in one of Jesus' parables, the assumption that it's all for my consumption. That's the easiest, clearest definition of greed I could give you. It's the assumption that it's all for my consumption. That generous people don't assume that everything that comes to them is for them. They don't uh, they don't assume that everything is theirs to consume. And to move from a life of greed to generosity, we have to reprioritize our lives, not just our money. Told you to be quiet, Jenny. You see, we have to rethink and reprioritize our finances around generosity and not consumption. And the world would go, you're crazy. And Jesus would say, it is crazy. But it's the best kind of crazy. That we build our lives around the kingdom of God and not our own. So you literally got to flip it. Here's what the world says when it comes to your money. Consume it, save it, give it. In that order. Consume, save it. If you can, and then give if there's anything left over. That's it. That's the way we live. Consume. When I meet with couples in premarital counseling, 
We talk about money. You want to know why? It's the number one cause of divorce. And it's not having too much of it. It's the stress and the burden of debt and consuming more than you bring in. Spending more than you bring in. That's what the world promotes. It's what the world allows you to do. You can get a credit card. You can go into debt. You can pay interest. And then we get burdened by it and it causes tensions and problems. So the world says consume even more. Save maybe. Give. And if there's anything left over. That's the world's model. Jesus flipped it. You literally flip it upside down. Here's what Jesus says. If you're going to prioritize generosity, if you are going to be a kingdom follower, you give first, you save second, and then you live on the rest. And if everyone would do that, and people go, well, how much do you do? I say, I would, 10% goes to the Lord, 10% goes into your savings and your future, and then live on 80% of your budget. And then as you get more money, try to get what you consume less and less and less and less. And Jesus says, the more you do that, the happier you'll be. Blessed is the one, happier is the one whose life is ordered around giving first, saving second, and then living on the rest. And when we do it God's way, studies prove to us, generous people give more, save more, and consume less. And they're happier. We have to choose it. We have to reprioritize our lives. We're going to talk about how to make that practical in just a second. Generous people, kingdom people, upside down, Jesus-loving followers of Jesus choose generosity over greed, and they choose God over self. And this plays out in every area of our life in the upside down kingdom, but especially when it comes to the area of money. And you go, well, why is that? Why is money so important? Jesus prioritized it, and we're going to get into it here in the Sermon on the Mount. And it's really plain and simple. If I can sum it up for you, is because according to Jesus, money is the greatest outward indicator of an inward spiritual condition. It's been said those who, in the area that you worry about the most, is the area that you trust God the least. And for a lot of people, they hold on to their money, they're not generous with it because they're worried about it. And they don't trust God with it. And choosing God over self, prioritizing your life around generosity, allows you to choose God over yourself. Jesus tells us, we talked about this, John 15, Jesus said, I am the vine, you are the branches. Remain in me, and I will remain in you. Those who remain in me can do anything. But apart from me, you can do nothing, right? You guys remember the awakening message? If you didn't see, go back. It's the foundation for this whole series. And Jesus says in Matthew 6, 19 through 21, that one of the best ways, the best way to remain in him is to release your money to him. To remain, you have to release. You go, that doesn't make sense. It's the upside down kingdom. Because he goes on to say this. Do not store up treasures for yourself on this earth. Don't build just your kingdom. Because that kingdom will pass away. Moss will destroy it, vermin will come in, thieves will steal it. But store up for yourselves treasures in heaven. Well, how do you do that? Where moss and vermin do not destroy, where thieves do not break in and cannot steal. Then he says this, this is what Jesus is saying, when to remain in him, you've got to release your resources to him, for wherever your treasure is, there your heart will also be. And Jesus says that our treasure, our money, and our heart are connected. And where you are sending and spending your money, there your heart will be also. That the heart follows our treasure and everything else follows our heart, our thoughts, our feelings. And that if he can get your money, he knows that he has your heart. And we like to kind of flip it, right? We like to say, for wherever my heart is, there my treasure will also be. But Jesus is very clear here, and he doesn't reverse the order. He says 
that your heart will follow your money. In other words, if you want to change where your heart is, change the direction of your money. You go, I don't know if I buy into that, Kyle. Well, take it up with Jesus someday. Secondly, just try this for me. Go and take a significant amount of money, let's just say $1,000, and invest it into a stock. Pick one. Maybe Tesla right now, you know, Apple, Amazon. It's expensive. You can only get a half a share with $1,000 maybe. I don't know. But take it, and guess what you're going to do? The next day, you're going to be like, I'm just going to check real quick. Stock app. Man, it went down. Went up, right? All of a sudden, you care about that stock because your heart follows your treasure. So Jesus says, if you want to change where your heart is, you've got to change the direction of your money. You see, saving is great. I talked about it. It's a principle. You've got to have it. But saving is how you say yes to you. Generosity is how you say yes to what's important to you. And Jesus said, apart from me, you can do nothing. But if you want to remain in me, your heart is in me, you got to release your money. you got to reprioritize your life around generosity and building my kingdom over your own. And you see, God can't be first in our lives if he is last in our budget. It doesn't work that way. Do we have a cricket sound effect we could plug in here? Someone to encourage me, cricket. So you go, well, how do I give? What do I do? How do I invest in God's kingdom? Like, how does it, okay, how do I get my money? Okay, well, where do I put it? Like, where do I do? Where do I invest it? Here's, here's my suggestion to you. Two, two things. Give from a grateful heart and a broken heart. So ask yourself, what are you grateful for? I don't know about you, I'm thankful for Jesus. <laughs> I'm thankful that he left heaven and came to earth, that he died on the cross for my sin, that while I was still yet sinning against him, he died in my place and offered me not only the promise of life to the full here and now, but the promise of eternity with him forever, that it was a free gift that I didn't have to earn, that he gave it to me. I'm thankful that God so loved the world that he gave Jesus for me. I'm thankful for that. I'm grateful for that. I'm grateful for this church. I'm grateful for you. I'm grateful for what God has done. I'm grateful for the lives that are being changed, and not just your lives. I'm grateful for that my life has been changed because of this place. Listen, I've worked at churches that I didn't really enjoy working at. This one, I love it. I love getting to do life with you. I love going to the Berlin football game when we could next year, right? And I see Adventure Church family everywhere. I love going to the store and people wave, hey, by how I love getting to do life with you. I love the difference that God is making through this local church. That thousands of people, thousands plus people have said yes to Jesus, baptized, finding their purposes, freed from addiction, marriage is being restored, finding fulfillment. God is doing, I'm grateful for this place. And so Jess and I have decided that we give first to here, to this house. We invest in this place because we're grateful for it. We always say that. If you're in with us, if you're a part of our family, that you would be invested in this local house. But today's not about Adventure Church. I'm going to give you an update before we leave on where we're at with everything. But it's not just about that. Because I've told people, and I'll tell you if, you, don't, if you don't believe in this place enough to give to it, go find a church that you can give to. Why? Because God wants you to be fulfilled. He doesn't want you to not be grateful. He doesn't want you to come to a church out of obligation. He wants you to be excited about what God is doing. I'm grateful for this place and the difference they make in my kids' lives and the leaders who invest in them. And I just love this place. I'm grateful for it. So I give to it. What are you broken over? What breaks your heart? Find something outside of the local church that breaks your heart. And give to it. For Jess and I, it's really easy. Our daughter went through open heart surgery. So anytime someone's going through that, anytime there's an opportunity to give to Nationwide and to do that, we invest in that because of what that place meant to us. I'm broken over kids who get cancer. I don't know what it is. There's just something 
that grips and breaks my heart when I know a child is suffering with cancer. So I give to that. And I give to those families. And I I pray for those families. We have a running list of kids that we pray for every night with our kids. Because I can't imagine being in that parent's shoes. It breaks my heart. So I give to those things that break my heart. So what are you grateful for? What are you broken over? Invest in those things. Well, how do we do that? Well, anything in life, right? It's a very practical approach to generosity. Can I just say that? It's a very spiritual issue, but it's a very practical approach. Practical. That we have to be intentional. Anything in life that we're successful in usually has a strategy and a plan. Your career, your health, your fitness, whatever it is, right? You have a strategy, you have a plan. Generosity for some of you comes natural. You give more. You just like, people are like, Look, listen, you don't have any more to give. Stop, right? Like your family's like, you gotta quit giving away everything you have, right? But for most of us, it's not natural. We need a plan in place. And we have to move from a 3S giver, that I would call it, to a 3P giver. A 3S giver is this. There's no plan. You consume first. You save a little, save a little give if there's anything less. A 3S giver is this. It's spontaneous, it's sporadic, and it's sparing. Man, Kyle, that was a good speech today. Right? No, I'm just, thank you, but that's not what I was saying. But it's like that, right? Again, a GoFundMe. You're like, oh, man, poor guy. Like, and it's sporadic. It's not a plan. It just happens when it happens. And then it's always sparing. Well, how much do I have? Okay. That's a 3S giver. You got to become a 3P giver. A 3P giver pre-decides and they pick a percentage. You pre-decide. It's premeditated. I'm going to be generous. And it, I don't care how much you make. I don't care how much in debt you are. You have to pre-decide, I'm going to be generous with a portion of what God has given to me. And it's like Maddox. It's mine. No, God says it's mine. Every blessing you have is from me. Every good gift comes from me. And you got to change your mindset. God, this is yours. I'm investing back. A 3P giver is priority, percentage, and progressive. It's a priority. You're generous. You do it first. You do it first, and you pick a percentage. Tithing to, to me is kind of the, the, the standard. I believe in it. Biblically, they teach upon it. Malachi 3 tells us to bring our tithe to the storehouse, to the house of God, that 10% of what God has given us goes back to his kingdom. But that's just the floor. It's not the ceiling. Jess and I have been blessed over the years that as we have tried to become progressive in our generosity and starting two years ago with our next initiative moved to 15%. And now we're able to do 15%. And listen, I'll never ask you to do what I don't do. But we have people in our church who give extravagantly more than that to the kingdom of God. So you pick a percentage. Maybe it's 1%. Maybe it's three, maybe it's four, and progressively we move our way up. In fact, in the first century, the Apostle Paul kind of ran into this dilemma with the church in Corinth. And he says this, 1 Corinthians 16, 1 through 2, now about the collection for the Lord's people. Do what I told the Galatian churches to do. On the first day of every week, each one of you should set aside a sum of money in keeping with your income Saving it up so that when I come, no collections will have to be made. And what he was saying is, is that I don't have to get up and do a speech and try to get you to give to the kingdom of God. You've already pre-decided. You've picked a percentage according with what you make in keeping with your income. So you set aside a sum of money first in keeping with your income. And you go, well, what does that exactly mean? To whatever extent one has prospered is what that means in the text. And I believe tithing. And I don't know why, it just came easy to us. I started tithing when I was 14 years old and I was bagging groceries at Kroger. I made five thirty-five an hour. And it was just, I got paid every Thursday, bam. My dad said, you give that to the church. And I just did it. No questions asked. And can I tell you something? I may have done it out of discipline, but now I do it out of blessing. I do it out of grace. I do it out of what I want to do. And people go, well, Kyle, tithing is Old Testament. Some of my scholars, biblical scholars in the room, that's, that's, that's Old Testament. Jesus 
you know, he, he brought grace for the law. He, there's grace now. We don't have to stick to the law. Listen, grace always gives more than the law. The law, it took a lamb to pay for our sin. Under grace, it took the life of Jesus, right? Jesus, when he came to the, the Sermon on the Mount, he said, I'm not coming to abolish the law. In fact, I'm raising the standard. And he raises the standard in every other area of the law. You have heard it said, do not murder someone. That was the law. Jesus said, if you get angry with someone, you're guilty of murder. You have heard, do not commit adultery. Jesus says, if you look at another woman with lust, you are guilty of adultery. So in every other area of the law, Jesus raises the standard. Why, when it came to money, the thing he talked about the most, would he lower it? And so we work our way to a place where we do that. I got a testimony just this past two weeks ago, sent to me in an email. A lady connected to our church, and she just said, Kyle, I just want you to know we feel so blessed to be able to give to the kingdom. We believe God is generous to let us keep the 90% upside down kingdom. And watching our family grow in their faith through Adventure Church has confirmed for us that this is a worthy investment. It's a heart change. It's an upside down kingdom. So, how grateful are you? How broken hearted are you? Set aside amount of money in keeping with your income. And here's where I'm gonna step on some toes. Is that okay? I've already stepped on them. I'm just gonna, I'm gonna jump on them right now. I was having a conversation with someone about this. And they said, they wanted me to give them a more like, well, break it down even more simpler for me. I, I, like, okay, in keeping with my income, but still. So 10%, okay, like that's kind of, but, but if, I, if I can't go there, where do I start? How do I really know that I'm more invested in God's kingdom over my own, which is what this is all about? Can we agree? Yes. It's not about a, a dollar amount. God's not after a certain amount of money. That, he's after your heart. He said, how can I know? And I said, here's the, here's the most simplistic way I can break it down for you. If you spend more money on entertainment and vacation than you give to the kingdom of God, you're living for yourself. Can you at least nod at me like that makes sense? <laughs> right, online, like, preach it. Put the fire emoji up or something, right? Like, but, right, when you think about it, can we agree that vacations are not a necessity? Okay, sometimes they are, but, right? That it's not a, God, when God said, I'll take care of you and give you everything you need, that he wasn't saying Disney World every year? That he wasn't saying, and I, go, I went to vacation. I go on that. But if, if you spend more here on entertainment, out to eat, date night, vacations, then you invest in the kingdom of God. It's out of balance. Jesus said, we have to reprioritize our lives around God and his word so that he can have our whole heart. And when he has our whole heart, every other area of our life is better. Matthew 6, 31 through 33, Jesus goes on. He talks about money. This is Sermon on the Mount still. He talks about worry. Why would you worry? Why would you get wrapped up in the things of this world? You don't live for this world. Look what he says. So don't worry about all these things. What will we eat? What will we drink? What will we wear? Those were legitimate worries for people that day. They literally had to think about where their next meal was coming from, where they would get clothes. They didn't have the things that we have. So Jesus is saying, why are you worried about your kids' college? Why are you worried about your 401? Why are you worried about all those things? He says, these things dominate the thoughts of unbelievers. Those who are living for this kingdom, all of their hope is in this kingdom. And so when this kingdom falls apart, their world falls apart. But that's not you. You're with me. You reign God. You're in control. You're over everything. I will not be afraid. Even when the markets tank, even when an election is looming, I'm not afraid because I live for your kingdom. I'm remaining in you. My heart is in you. My peace is in you, right? That's the benefits of following God. He says, 
Those things dominate the thoughts of unbelievers. So put your heart, remain in me. And Jesus says the best way to get your heart in me is to release your money. The thing that's the greatest competitor for your heart. He says, unbelievers worry about that stuff. But your father already knows everything you need. Today and 20 years from now. So, what do you do? Seek the kingdom of God above all else, self. Live right, pursue righteousness, follow the path that Jesus has laid out for you. And what will God do for you if you do that? He'll give you everything you need. Not want, need. People have asked me through COVID, through the church, and I mean, we had a great plan in place, a great strategy to get that building built, and everything was, phew, we were just sailing. It's good. And then all of a sudden, a virus comes, and bam. So I've talked to pastors, I've talked to some of you. Pastor, are you just, I mean, are you freaking out? Or like, I mean, what are you going to do? Like, you're out of room, you're still out of room, and they, I mean, what are you, how long is it going to take now? I mean, what, where, what's going on? Are you, are you worried? And I legitimately 100% look at them and go, dude, it's not mine, it's God's. They go, I mean, but yeah, I mean, you're, at least some, some nights, like, right, you got to wrestle with none, none. I don't worry about it. We still plan. We still strategize. We still talk. The board still meets. Still trying to figure everything out. But I don't worry about it. Why? You go, why? Because we're seeking first the kingdom of God. And he said that if I do that, he'll do that. Every promise comes with a premise. I'm handling my portion. God's going to handle his. How many of you would like to live worry-free financially? How many of you want that? I mean, you want it, right? You want to live worry-free financially? Jesus said it's really easy. Put my kingdom over your own. And when you do that, I will fulfill my part when you do your part. You give first, you save second, and you live on the rest. You give first, and when you do this, everything changes. You will remain in Christ. Your heart will stay connected to Jesus, and you will be more generous, and happier is the one whose life is ordered around generosity, around giving and not receiving. Church, I know it's upside down. But I'm telling you, I've been walking with Jesus since I was 14. It works. The church's finances and my own, I don't worry because my trust is in him. The band's coming, we're gonna close out. And here's the reality that I hope sticks with you today. I've made some bad purchases in my life. Anybody else? Just go, ah, oh, why did I buy that, you know? So, oh, regrets. Wish I could have taken it back, you know, whatever. Here's the thing. I've been tithing since I was 14. I've never, ever gotten my contribution statement and gone, oh. Oh, man, I gave that much? Man called the church. Any way I could get a refund on October, November? Gosh, we weren't even meeting. What were you guys doing? I've never once regretted what I've invested in the kingdom of God. Not one dollar, not one minute. I've never gone down to the Dream Center and served and been with people. I've never gone and prayed with someone and, and left there and went, man, I wish I wouldn't have done that. What a waste. Never. Because it's the kingdom of God. It's eternal. It's souls. It's people. It's the only thing that matters. It's people. It'll be worth everything that you invest in his kingdom. Not only does God say, yeah, it's worry-free. I got you. 
I'm with you. I'll provide. It's not on you. It's on me. I'll handle all of it. Not only does he say that, he says, then I'll give you more. When you're good with little, I'll give you more. Because what does God do? Those who are generous with the kingdom, he brings more. Because if he can get it through you, he's going to bring it to you. Because God set it up this way. We are the ones, the followers of Jesus are the ones who are to fund his kingdom. It's the way it works. It's the way it is and it does work. C.S. Lewis said it like this. Aim at heaven and you will get earth thrown in. Aim at earth, you get neither. It's upside down. This world would say, you are crazy. And I would say, and Jesus would say, you'd be crazy not to. Stand with me. We're going to sing today. And as we do, I want to challenge you. One, let's worship him for what he's done. Let's not neglect that today. I have a bad time at celebrating wins because I'm so driven to get on to the next mission. Let's just thank him for what he's done. Thank you, God, for the lives that you've changed, for the people, for you, for the kingdom, for what you're doing here in this community, through this house. We thank you for it. But come on, let's give more so he can do more. There's more to be done, and it's going to require more of you and me. But can I tell you, it'll be worth it. Someday you're going to stand before him. And you're going to see Jesus face to face. And he's going to go, well done. Now you can come into my kingdom where nothing will ever destroy it. Where you'll be safe and secure in the presence of God for eternity. We live for another world, for a different king and another kingdom. And you'll never regret one second one dollar that you invest in his kingdom.